All righty, folks. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This rainy Milwaukee evening, and welcome to United We Read. Yeah. Oh, it's so good to say. I love it. Um, it is so wonderful to be back doing one of these events here at uh, my favorite bookstore, Woodland Pattern. Uh, support your local bookstore. Go browse. Check out some beautiful stuff. Amazing collections. We've got all kinds of stuff coming up. Uh, this Sunday, in fact, we have the, um, he pulled up on his phone, How to Haiku, Exploring the Power of 17 Syllables, a workshop with Darlin Nikki Jansen. There's also going to be, I think, a uh, yeah, haiku slam and poetry showcase. This is Sunday. Um, oh, that says April 3rd. Did this already happen? The workshop was last weekend. Oh, the workshop was, thank you. Slam right. <laughs> this is why I don't get paid to do this, so. <laughs> But anyway, so yes, in, in any event, get a book. Woodland Pattern has lots of them. They're all very good. They're quite interesting, so yes. Um, it's already been a wild day for the world and for us here in Milwaukee, so let's get right into it, folks. Yeah? Who wants to hear some uh, written word? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, you should clap that. We'll clap at that. All right. So our first individual doesn't really need an introduction. We all know this individual, but we're going to do it anyway, just to remind you how awesome they are. So Elizabeth Hoover is the author of The Archive is All in Present Tense. I love that title, which received the 2021 Barrow Street Books Prize and is forthcoming in October. In the fall, she will join the faculty of Webster University as an assistant professor of creative writing. Yeah, very awesome. Everyone, Elizabeth Hoover. much. Um, whatever the answer is, is fine. Is the distance set up so that I can take my mask off? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I um, was the assistant director of the creative writing program um, with Mauricio, who was so patient with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and so I wasn't able to participate in United Reread, so it's really exciting to get to participate. Um, I feel very strange to be on the other side of it. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, and I wanted to read an excerpt from an essay I wrote, um, because I'm thinking, I'm in my fifth year, so I'm leaving. Um, I'm moving to St. Louis. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, what has made that possible. Um, and one of the people who um, has made my time here really possible, um, like productive, sorry, I'm not emotional. It's just the way my voice sounds, um, uh, is Liam. So I wanted to um, thank Liam Callanan. When I came here five years ago, I was pretty rattled by the experiences that I had had before I came here. I, um, and I remember when I was in my MFA, um, there was a very famous man, <laughs> cis man, uh, poet there, and he said to me, you know, Elizabeth, one of your problems is your ambition. Um, you're too ambitious of a writer. And I remember going to Liam's office with an idea for an essay, and it had a lot of um, parts to it, a lot of different threads. And I was so nervous because I wanted to bring all these threads together and you just told me to do it. Um, and it's meant a lot to me. Um, it's also annoying because <laughs> I have kind of felt very comfortable in my misandry. Um, and so the fact that you in particular um, on one hand, it's been very annoying, but also our relationship has been very healing to me, and I want to thank you for that. Um, so I want to read an excerpt of it, this essay. It's called Volta, 
And um, I do want to let folks know that it mentions my experience um, be with sexual violence as a child. Um, and it also mentions um, suicide attempts. I've never excerpted an essay, so it might make no sense. <laughs> so that's your other trigger warning. Confusion. OK. You should check out the witch's house, Erica says, body slung between two camp chairs in my backyard. When I was in the group home, they'd bus us around to the weird sites of Milwaukee. That was my favorite. The phrase group home floats like a lure above us. But we've been friends for over a decade, so instead I ask, what's the witch's house? It's the estate of the artist Mary Knoll. She filled her yard with these concrete sculptures. Erica lives in Seattle with her wife as in, and is in town for a few days to help her dad move into a retirement home. Culling through his stuff earlier that day, she'd found a photograph of herself at 13 with a teased out perm and a pink sweater vest. She brought it with her and we had laughed at her terrible 90s fashion. People gave me such a hard time for being a tomboy, she explained. I tried following the rules of being a girl just so people would leave me alone. The appearance of the female body can be a troublesome disruptive disruption, thrusting you into visibility, inviting regulation. For me, the trouble appeared in the form of a gray sedan crawling behind me as I walked from day camp to the bus stop, the sound of automatic locks, my last clear memory of the summer. I ask Erica why she refers to Noel's sculpture garden as the witch's house. The neighbors started calling it that, and the name stuck, she explains. When they took us up there, they didn't even tell us who the artist was. They just said it was the witch's house. What does that tell you about what people think about women artists? A few months later, I drive to the Knoll Estate in Fox Point, a wealthy community just north of Milwaukee. Since Knoll died in 2001, the Kohler Art Center has acquired the property and attempted to open it to the public only to be thwarted by the neighborhood council who are afraid throngs of visitors will affect property values. I ignore the no parking signs and get out of my car to peer through the chain link fence. The house sits on the edge of Lake Michigan obscured by a stand of pines. On either side of the driveway are two cement columns topped with grinning busts. Noel helped her dad build these posts, minus the busts, in 1924 when she was 10, shortly after he bought the one and a third acre site for a summer home. After her father died of cancer in 1961, Noel transformed the property into an art environment or an art installation meant to be viewed in its entirety in situ. Associated with folk and outsider art, Art environments are often built within an artist's home or on their property and made from cheap and found materials. Art historians have identified only three art environments built by women in the United States. Knoll's house is one of them. Knoll made her own concrete from sand she hauled up from the nearby beach, shaping it into friendly creatures. To the left of the driveway, I notice a snub-nosed dinosaur scaled in beach pebbles with insulators for eyes. I walk along the fence, glancing over my shoulder to check for irate neighbors. Through slats, I spied a collection of sculptures filled with moments of intimacy and physical touch. A person with a jaunty hat holds an enormous fish on their lap the two facing each other with open smiles. Four children with arms slung around each other look to the sky, and a languid cyclops snuggles its long-limbed companion. The few lone creatures touch themselves, palms pressed to their chests, or arms wrapped around columnar, columnar torsos. Frustrated that I can only clap catch glimpses through the fence, I climb back into my car. 
driving south on the wide and curving roads while trees gop, drop golden leaves on generous lawns. I can't help but think of a bus full of kids from a group home looking out on these pristine mansions and the level of violence they must have experienced to be removed from their homes. And my friend among, among them, and in those moments in which we have forgotten our friendship, forgotten her marriage, and become tangled together as if trying to cheat physics, I have pressed my mouth to the twin scars on her wrist in gratitude to the girl who found her and the body's stubborn will and whatever story she wants to tell me without asking her for more. Born in 1914 to a successful lawyer and aspiring singer, Noel grew up on the south side of Milwaukee, flying kites and playing with her older brother, Max. She formed the Under the Porch Club, a group of friends who wrote secrets on scraps of paper they buried in empty soda bottles. We always had more bottles than secrets, she recollected. As a child, I had more secrets than bottles, what happened, honey, asked the nurse in the emergency room. Did you fall off your bike? Bereft of language, I nodded. It seemed plausible that I had fallen or that my body had. I had lost track of it weeks ago, slipped out of it as easily as changing out of gym clothes. Let's get a doctor and something for the pain. It was like I'd been idly listening to a conversation at the end of a long hallway and suddenly overheard my name. Pain, it beckoned me back, this mean and spiteful scrape. It was a joyful reunion to run back into the arms of my own living body. I thought I'd never see it again, that it was locked in a car or on the ground in the woods where I left it, being rained on, discovered by scavengers. I started talking and I couldn't stop. I related the plot of Essie Hitton's The Outsiders. I sang Simon and Garfunkel's Kathy song. I told jokes. The, nurse clus the nurses clustered around my bed and beamed. I was so charming, no one bothered to contact the authorities. Noel didn't start working on her art environment in earnest until her late 40s. She began it in 1961, a year after her brother Max was killed in a car accident. He had been a diver, setting a world record when he reached 340 feet in Lake Michigan. In college, oh, Mary, went, uh, Mary Noel went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. In college, Mary drew a comic strip called Danny Diver about a lonely diver searching for friends on the ocean floor. In one, he takes a ride on a grouper until the fish slips from his grasp. In another, he tries having a conversation with a skeleton splayed out next to a shipwreck. Many of the sculptures in her yard have featureless oval faces like Max's diving masks. When I write about women artists, I wrestle with how to account for the personal, dispirited by how often critics deny women choice attributing their art to personal tragedy, instinct, or to madness. I want to find a way to bring pain into the critical conversations without erasing genius or reducing a woman to her wounds. Can I see the possibility of arguing that Noel's work is in part related to the trauma of losing Max without it feeling like a threat to her seriousness as an artist? to women's seriousness in general, to my own seriousness as an artist. In Waste Not, Want Not, an inquiry into what women saved and assembled, femage, Miriam Shapiro and Melissa Meyer define a feminist art practice within the arena of decorative craft. Oh, sorry, I'm used to doing poetry readings where you like chat a lot between. Um, <laughs> so if folks aren't familiar, um, Miriam Shapira and Melissa Meyer are really interesting. They created um, 
the feminist art program at CalArts. It was the first feminist art program in the United States. And it was really interesting because they actually didn't allow men to participate. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I think a lot about what I can learn from the radical feminists in the 1970s while also recognizing the problematics of it, like particularly their transphobia. Um, but anyways, I, I was just thinking about that because um, I'm really in love with Larry Pittman and Larry Pittman wanted to be a part of the feminist art program and he couldn't be because um, he was assigned male at birth. Okay, sorry, what was I talking about? Miriam Shapiro and Melissa Meyer. <laughs> Femage. They write, women have always collected things and saved and recycled them because leftovers yield nourishment in new forms. These cheap and free materials, images excised from discarded magazines, remainder fabric, shoe boxes, are available to artists without institutional support. In addition, the art practices related to these materials enable women to make art covertly via activities that are acceptable according to received gender roles. Quilts, memory boxes, and decoupage are craft, while Picasso's collages, Joseph Cornell's boxes, and Mike Kelly's button collecting are fine art. Not to shade Mike Kelly, I love Mike Kelly. Um, Noel, spent her in, Noel spent her life working on and making art in and around her house. It was a space in which she could work without bowing to the aesthetic standards of the art world or to the commercial demands of craft. She kept a rigorous schedule, devoting almost every waking hour to projects, carving, blue, carving a blue wooden gate for the driveway, adding to the menagerie of sculptures, and covering the exterior of the house in bas-relief fish. Like Femage artists, she relied on cast-offs, driftwood heaved up from the beach, boxes of old buttons, carpet remnants, plywood scavenged from the dump. She ate nothing but scrambled eggs for a week, blowing out the innards and cutting delicate windows in the shells. She created tiny dioramas inside with discarded toys. Her art rose from the exigencies of material. Figures without armatures puddle at the edges, skeletal dancers made from bristling clumps of driftwood, or the crooked whimsy of a face accommodating a burl. We use what we have to invent what we need, writes Audrey and Rich. What I have is other writers. I get feral around citations, searching for methods for constituting the self via grammar, the solidity of experience concretized into words. I found my way into writing via my own femage, layering fragments of others with my own fragmentary memory. Poetry is my chosen medium in part because it simultaneously creates and shatters form via the line break and is therefore particularly well suited for a flickering self. Like the author Chris Krause, oh, this is a quote, I fused my silence and repression with the entire female gender silence and repression. Krause adds, there's not enough female irrepressibility written down. I think the sheer fact of women talking, being paradoxical, inexplicable, flip, self-destructive, but above all else, public, is the most revolutionary thing in the world. Noel was irrepressible. There isn't a sliver of that house she didn't perform an intervention on. She used carpet remnants to make bright textured prints on the wall, traced gold stripes around interior columns, and scribbled paint on the carpet chairs, even the phone. Shapiro and Meyer urge us to see Femage's aesthetic elements for what they are, the natural materials needed for spiritual and often physical survival. And just because art keeps us alive doesn't mean it isn't serious, isn't worthy of study, and driven by canny choices. Noel also wrote obsessively. Her, her writing is rooted in action, rarely reflection or emotion. 
One of the few reflective remarks she made was to her biography, Barbara Man Manger. She said, art gives me identification. Identification is an action or a process inflected with movement rather than fixity. Art is a means to discover a way of becoming rather than an expression of who you are. Around the age 53, Knoll ended a three decade long period of complete isolation, writing in her journal, I've carried my privacy much too far. She joined several women's clubs and invited women over to collaborate on art projects and to read with her. She also reignited her friendship with Rosalind Tubising, who she had met in 1941 when they were both teaching middle school. They bonded over wanting to try new ways of making art and set up a clandestine glass blowing studio in the school. In 1945, they both apprenticed at Midwestern Pottery Company, renting rooms next to each other in a boarding house. Noel begged Ross, as she called her, to break off her engagement so the two of them could start a pottery business together. When Ross refused, Mary stopped speaking to her. When Mary reached out 30 years later, later she was delighted that Ross enthusiastically reciprocated her offer for friendship. You can't really understand Noel's work without entering her art environment. I managed to charm my way in after a chance encounter with the conservator who lives in the house. As we tour the property, oh sorry, I'm learning about excerpting. Okay, sorry. As we tour the property, the lake is a constant presence, murmuring, crashing, or urging hush, hush, no matter where we are. The multicolored living room has an enormous window overlooking the expanse. The photos I'd seen collapsed the space, making it look compulsively filled, full of the anxiety of horror vacui pieces or the claustrophobia of Victorian design. Once inside, that sense disappears. This is a house a person lived in. She left herself space to move around. Instead of crowded, the art is present and companionable. Everywhere you turn, a new discovery in the form of a tiny diorama, drawing, or delicate sculpture perched in a corner. There was an exterior piece I have been drawn to in the book, and I asked the conservator if I could spend some time with it. He takes me outside to four children sitting on a bench, arms loosely hung around each other. Three have their heads flung back, disc-shaped faces almost parallel to the ground. Their mouths are open smiles, collecting needles from the evergreens above. Their hair is in spikes, so their faces look like cartoon suns or unthreatening porcupines. The fourth has shoulder-length hair, her free arm is tucked into her stomach. She leans slightly away from the others, chin down. After strolling along the length of the piece, I crouch to bring myself to her level, try to look into her blank, concrete eyes. Do you think it's a self-portrait? I asked the conservator. I've never thought about it that way, but you know, she didn't really make self-portraits. After a few minutes of silence, he points to a globular cement tower. Hollow in the center, the tower is embedded with scare, squares of blue, red, and yellow. A lot of found artists use glass to make mosaics, he explains, but she made stained glass. She incorporated the glass pieces so the sun can come through. As I orbit the tower, I see flashes of light flickering through bits of glass. In the morning, it makes these intense beams of color, colored light, he tells me. I was circling Mary Knoll looking for her trauma. But Knoll is an artist of delight. Her aesthetics are rooted in pleasure. In one of her yearly Christmas letters, she describes the pleasure of mixing concrete in a wheelbarrow and straining sand from the beach a pleasure she discovered while helping her father build the gateposts as a girl. 
I am sure my sculpture-filled yard has its origins in those gateposts. If it is possible to fuse our repression and silence, it must also be possible to fuse our joy. What I learned from Noel is less about trauma and more about transformation. Noel's art followed materials, allowing their inherent qualities and serendipitous discovery to guide her process. As a poet, I follow my materials into an unexpected place, the courtly tradition of the sonnet. It's a form that relies on a turn called a volta. This volta is an intervention into the communal space of language, mediating between the public and private because it dramatizes an internal emotional or intellectual change. It can enact healing via language. If the scraps I begin my femage with are what's left over from sexual trauma, I can still end up with a tower filled with morning light. I desperately want Mary Knoll to be gay and have a secret lover, Ross or another woman who walks through her garden placing her palm on the heads of the sculptures as if anointing them. Maybe she brings Mary marbles or shells to sink into wet concrete. Maybe they wear thick wool socks and drink tea as wind whips off the lake. I want this not only because I'm constantly and selfishly searching for models as I build my own life, because I also know that exhilaration of catching a glimpse of your unbroken self, a sense that you have finally come home. And I want that for her. I want that for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that with us, Elizabeth. And thank you for this, too. Um, I get feral around citations. I love that. I love that. Wow. All right. We are off. And I can't get into my phone for these bios. Oh, hey, there we go. All right. Next up, we have Juan Rodriguez, who is a current doctoral student at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. You guys know where that is? Um, he received his MFA from University of San Francisco and his bachelor's from, is that DePaul University? DePaul University. Uh, lover of the Midwest, he left sunny California in order to brave the winters of Milwaukee. His poetry often deals with relationships, masculinity, traveling, the criminal justice system, and sometimes a convergence of all four. With a few publications under his belt, the most recent being in High Shelf Press, his poetry career is just beginning. Juan, everyone. Thank you for that great introduction, Seth. Oh, man. I just got some poems for y'all tonight. Thank y'all. I'm glad to be out here. And yeah, I'm glad y'all guys braved the rain and the wind and the cold. It was actually freezing. All right. How to lose your culture. Be born Mexican, be born black, be both. Grow up raised by only one, not the black side. Have no friends. Nobody wants to be friends with the mutt that doesn't speak Spanish. Make friends by letting the other kids cheat off your homework and tests. Try to learn Spanish. Fail. Learn all the swears in Spanish. Pay close attention. <laughs> Pay close attention to Mayate. Leave all your peers behind. Go to a private high school surrounded by white people. Be, be black. Be told you're black but not really black by the white kids. Swallow pride. Hold your fist because any other high school in the area just isn't good enough. Who told you this? White lies. Swallow pride. Swing out the air. Forgive your Mexican childhood. Who dictates who can be black? Raised by your Mexican mother, how could you be black? Hate your father, go to college, hear your educated Mexican peers tell you that you're not really Mexican, protest. Bring up your name, homemade tamales in December, birthday is Cinco de Mayo, hear 
What kind of Mexican doesn't speak Spanish? You're a disgrace to the race, a cultural belief. Hate the culture. Go home for family events. Love your family. Hate the culture. Love your family. Denounce the culture. Come to terms that your father ain't shit. Identify as black. Mexican in name only. Ask, what does it mean to be black? Have no answer. You've asked the wrong question. Ask, what does it mean to be me? All right. My mother leads me at my grandmother's when I'm asleep. Slung over your shoulder, blanket covering my face, light reflecting from the ground wakes me. A short walk from our house to grandma's, one hand across your body, the other dangles, fingers limp. Caught between a wave and a fist, you rub my back, wedding ring running up my spine. You were never married to my father. I fall back asleep before my mouth asks you why. And then, uh, so capital, capital flea market, San Jose. It's in the name, but yes, it is a, a nice place to go to if you ever find yourself out in the Bay Area. The flea market on Saturdays and Sundays. Capital flea market, San Jose, California. We sell Saturdays and Sundays, leaving the house at 4.30 a.m. to sit in a line of moonlights waiting for daylight to be let in. My mother, my mother doesn't sleep for this. She nudges me awake. I set up tables and lay out blankets over drive-in parking squares, unloading bags of women's jeans organized by size, 60 pairs, but I never had a sister. My brother's never married, and I wait for the third for the third time, sun pounding my face, my mother is telling a story of a daughter-in-law she doesn't have. My mother sells her dreams that for five minutes, we all believe. My grandmother died when I was seven. My grandmother died when I was seven. I retained two memories of her, both in Wilshire's. I raise my foot from the ground as, she, uh, as I ask her to tie my shoes. She tells me a secret, how my grandfather never learned to tie his own. The other is me falling asleep as she watched a novella. Within her sight was considered babysitting. I slept through the years with her. Maybe I should have learned Spanish. Then again, I was seven. What's to say I still wouldn't forget her? Maybe she shouldn't have died of cancer. Whose fault is that anyways? At 13, I cry over her grave. I do the same for my tia, buried 10 graves apart, and six months after, brain cancer. I hardly remember her either. I ask my mother, where's my grandfather? You've already visited his grave. I hadn't noticed the shared, the shared headstone. I give my grandmother all my tears. Right, I'm taller than my father. Sitting at the edge of her bed, at her, excuse me, sitting at the edge of her bed, my mother laughs at me. Tells me how my scrunched face, bunched nose, and wrinkled vein between my eyes was the same face my father made. She told me when he made it, but she could have said in thought, anger, or fear, didn't matter because he never made it around me, wasn't around him enough, or maybe I didn't know him enough. It might have been his Friday after a third Heineken face. We were just his weekday go to work face. He never went to work. I hate my face. I no longer look at her with the same eyes. I wonder, does he think about me? ever see my face, no matter how far away he is, I can never get rid of him. All right. This one deals with like, the narrator deals with like a porn addiction, so it goes into that realm. I'm just letting y'all know now. <laughs> Addict. I wish someone spoke to me about porn. I'm not an idiot. Actresses paid to bounce and bend in positions outside a norm or remotely plausible. Consent a dollar amount. How does that convert to drinks? It doesn't. What's an appropriate amount of time to beat my meat in a week? 
day. Is it weird? I know porn stars by name. Alexis, Texas, Tina, Trump. Stage name seared into my palm. The only woman I'm truly intimate with. Why is not hente mainstream? Tentacle porn, animated aggression doesn't make it any less rape. Stop. A question answers a question. I pray that doesn't seep into my subconscious. My girl calls me daddy. Are we cute or taboo? Last week I came right as a lady on my phone screen shuddered out of fuck. I love you. I cut the phone off, tossed my sock across the room, disgusted with myself. I fell asleep. Yeah. Are you going to school today? We lived two blocks from middle school. My mother would wake me rubbing my back. She'd say, I gotta sing this. Juanito, Juanito, are you going to school today? Juanito, Juanito, are you going to school today? Her voice wasn't sweet, but truthful. I learned to take showers at night, giving me an extra 10 minutes to sleep. Top of a wooden bunk bed, ladder removed, soon as I was able to jump to reach it. Changed, no lunch money, we were fed by the state. She'd walk my brother and I to school, holding hands to cross the street. She'd drop us off and pick us up by the redwood. It felt like she was waiting all day. Private high school meant tuition. Food versus lights became food versus lights versus tuition. Pick one. I ran track, homework on a bus, slept on the floor where the cold settled in, took quick showers in the morning, the frost of my breath less prevalent with the sun. The three months we were camping, we lived without power. No, oh, excuse me. The three months we were camping were my fault. We led without power occasionally growing up. If a bill fell on Friday, my mother let it go past due. We did the flea market Saturday and Sunday, Capitol in San Jose, reselling used clothes and thrift store finds. We made enough to survive. You can't sell the rain. And a blanket not thick enough to reach her bones before I left the house, my mother would ask, are you going to school today? And then uh, I got three more, three more. At a friend's Thanksgiving, a man slips nigger and spick into my drink. I grab ice out the styrofoam cooler. I don't feel cold. Filling my cup three quarters, I set it down on the washer. Spin cycle just finished. Warm cherry coke hisses and cracks. My brothers taught me to pour in mixer first. The ice pops and sizzles as the soda falls through. Pour to the ice line, melting as the soda comes closer. Open the jack, let it take me to the brim. Taste, too cherry, fill again. Taste liquid cherry pie warm down my throat, no whiskey burn. Fill to the brim again. It burns my throat, smacking my tongue to the top of my mouth, just searing the words along my cheeks as if there was a chance for them to escape. Elegy for myself. Your most recent, your most recent photo, college graduation, cap and gown draped over a blue button up, white French cuffs, black slacks. Were you handsome then? Dark eyes, a smile holding the weight of a sleepless night, drinking dark liquor. The morning you piss clear as if your soul was clean. You look tired. Five brothers carry your casket, the baby of the family. They dig your mother up to dig down as if time wasn't enough to push her memory further away. She would have covered your casket in roses. Instead, you're a black spot among graves waiting for the cover up. 
Your brother's tears mix with dirt, their love always muddied, stuck on the outside. Count on your cold hands how many times they said, I love you. I loved you. At 10, your brothers taught you how to drink. You were just happy to be included, their mini bartender, grabbing a red solo cup, filling to the brim with frozen cubes. Your small hands struggled with the bottle of whiskey. You watched its dark warmth fizzle through the ice, melting, over pores non-existent, save room for a splash of coke. Don't spill. Liquor sticks to your fingers, webbed hands, too late to wash off, the liquor stains forever. Casket lowered, empty bottle of whiskey tucked between your arm and heart. Your brothers drank all the love it could provide. Faces flush red with the memory of their mini bartender. They forgot to leave you some. And death you piss clear in their memory you look you looked happy you looked handsome you look happy right. last one i'm taller than my mother <clears throat> yeah. see the theme here <laughs> my mother lives in a cotton box room she sleeps on a queen bed, three quarters of it smothered in clothes. The room has hills of shirts, jeans, men's and women's. Below the clothes are bins stacked upon each other. There's a trail of yellow mail and tattered magazines from her bed to the door. It's the only way to travel through the mounds. I'm 6'3", my mother's 5'7", the peaks or clothes are 6'5", rolling hills of blue, green, white, and khaki clumped together. My mother wasn't always a hoarder. I can't remember it when I was younger. Life of excess clothing started the year her mother and sister died. She cries when we try to clean up her grief. To get rid of anything reminds her of how in life there's nothing you truly ever get to keep. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Juan's one of the folks that I met when we were exclusively online and you only see like this much of a person uh, last spring. And so talking about uh, taller than my mother, taller than my father, um, I had that weird surreal moment when we actually met in person at Hubbard or Estabrook. And it's like, you see someone walking and you see their whole like form and you've never seen it before. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. And we had this awkward moment where he knew immediately who I was, I think. And I was like, <laughs> very awkward. So that made me think of that. Because so, you were like, did you think I was like shorter? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so next up, we've got Beth Vigoran. Oh my goodness, Beth Vigoran was born and raised in rural Minnesota. She writes from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she is pursuing her PhD as a first generation student while raising her son as a single mother. Please welcome my friend, Beth. I guess I should have taken my jacket off before I got it up. All right. Um, hi, thank you. So I um, don't usually hear people dedicate readings, but I'm going to dedicate uh, this reading to my stepdad, Mark, who passed away a little over four years ago um, in April, on April Fool's Day, on Easter Sunday. So now I get to enjoy April 1st to whenever Easter is, and it is becoming my own kind of personal wake for him. Um, so this is the first time I'm wearing this dress since I gave his eulogy. And I think I also need to dedicate this to Angus, my son, it is not easy. <laughs> also, <laughs> being the child of a single mother trying to get a PhD um, in a state where there is no family, right, to support us. Okay. 
a how-to guide for attending funerals in the Midwest by Twyla Nelson. Step one, repeat to yourself. You have a right to be angry. Feed that spark. You have a right to be angry. Take a deep breath. Clear your throat as you exhale. Say it again, louder this time, scream it. You have a right to be angry. Now you're getting somewhere, take your heart rate. It should be high. You should work out more. But rage, your rage, this rage is healthy. It's powerful. You are powerful. Step two, think about who you're doing it for. All the women who should be screaming, that have every right to but keep silent. You might consider your mother, the cruelty she absorbed for a certain kind of safety. Think of the words of comfort she gave that asshole so he wouldn't feel bad. Think of her saying, forgiving him, but never at your rage. Keep her look of disappointment in your mind. Along with the sting of her words, what is wrong with you? Step three, note your emergency exits. Make a plan for hauling ass out of there. Avoid private residences. Public spaces are important. Step four, it helps to have a Joel, a collaborator, but you don't need him. Proceed alone if you're up for it. You've got more invested in this than he does. He stands to gain or lose pleasure. You stand to gain or lose pain. That makes you powerful. He's just hungry. Step five, when the moment comes, when you can't hold in all the anger and hypocrisy, the truth everyone knows but never says, don't. Don't hold it in. Deep breath, then let it out. They'll all be watching. The motel's been dead quiet for hours, and the lobby could use a vacuuming, but Twyla figures Joel can do it when he gets here. He's late enough that she entertains calling over to the bar and having Tony send his ass to work. The town's only motel, conveniently or inconveniently, depending on who you ask, shares a parking lot with the town's only bar. This is a one-of-a-kind place. And Twyla doesn't usually mind Joel's tardiness because more minutes mean more money and there isn't shit else to do with her time. But tonight she has news and can't stop watching for the glare of Joel's douchey white, too bright LED headlights. When the blinding lights arrive like God through the clouds, Twyla gets into position, waiting for the moment he struts through the entry. His cologne announces his arrival just as much as the squeaking door, and in a movement belying her size, Twyla leaps from behind the desk singing, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Thank you, God, for the gifts Joel is about to bestow on us. She's waving her arms up and down, chanting, We're not worthy! We're not worthy for an on-time arrival! Who kicked it now, Joel asks. The energy radiating from Twyla is infectious. It could be the vodka, but this is not the first time Joel wonders what it would be like to fuck Twyla in her present state. Those piercing green eyes lighting up her usually dull face. It's one you'll like. She pauses for a moment. I'll give you a hint. 50 years. The difference in age between husband and wife, Joel asks. Fuck, how did you find out before me? I just came from the bar. Yes, I can smell you, and I'm sure most of our guests will appreciate a familiar face when they return here. I go there for my hobbies. You've got a lot of those. I know it. Just so I'm clear, was tonight about your drinking, fucking, or gambling? I had my darling. Ah, so all of the above. It doesn't say how he died. Stupid obits rarely ever say how the person died. Textbook case of burying the lead. Textbook? You, Joel asks. And burying the lead doesn't have to actually be in there to be buried. Like good old Dick Watnamo's about to be. I do the jokes around here, Twyla says. Funeral's Thursday. You can go with me, right? I'm not so sure. What's it worth to me? Friendship. I might be busy, he sniffs. It's at New Hope. You said they prepare the best spread. But they have the worst pianist, he says. Oh, come on. Don't be so hard on your mom. Come get some carrot cake with me, please. What time? You know I work late. 11, which is damn near noon, so you can make an exception. It's been so long since someone good died. 
fine. I'll go if you get out of here. I need a vacuum. You got a boss. See you tomorrow. Don't be late. Twyla's friendship with Joel solidified a few years back when Hilda Anderson died. The relief Twyla felt at hearing that old sack of bones had passed away changed her outlook for the first time in her life. She wanted to go to a funeral, but she didn't want to go alone. Back then, they were working the night shift together when Twyla had an idea. Not long after, the pair found themselves at Hilda's graveside burial. When the preacher started yet another prayer, Twyla began to sing, Glory to God! Throwing confetti she'd stuffed in her pocket all over the coffin, the pastor, and those closest to the grave. She was dancing around like a holy jumper circling in a mosh pit of gravestones. Joel was a study in shock until movement from the corner of his eyes caused him to bolt for Twyla and then right past her, onward toward the parked cars lined up on the narrow shoulder of the gravel road. Unperturbed by Joel's cowardice, Twyla sang out, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Garth sang that. Hilda, she, she liked Mr. Brooks. Let's rejoice. Rejoice in the day that the Lord has made. The mechanic, Ole Gunderson, caught her arm, his gnarled hand of vice. If you only believe, Twyla sang. If you only believe, she said, laughing at her own joke, trying to shake the last of her confetti onto him. Her behavior shocked him into letting her go. Twyla ran toward, toward Joel, who was hunkered down in the driver's seat of his new, in his new truck, rejoicing in her newfound religion. Joel was slower in finding his purpose. They were a few funerals in by the time he learned how to circulate the room. Refilling coffee mugs, grabbing another pitcher of lemonade, always making time to eat dessert with the widow table. He likes carrot cake. The women, they desire chocolate with a smidge of vanilla ice cream, small bites, thick knuckled, hard laboring hands, covering dentures with chocolate in their crevices. Twyla likes watching him whisper in a woman's ear, leaning in close without touching. She knows that he makes sure his voice goes right into the ear, sending tingles down their spines. He'll wait until she reaches for him first. Then it's safe to give the thigh a gentle pat, a soft stroke. He might gently trail his fingers down her arm if he thinks no one is looking, leaning in for another whisper to cover the movement. He told Twyla about this show he watched on AMSR or ASMR, something like that. It's worked wonders. He even started his own YouTube channel that's almost monetized. Just a few more subscribers. Twyla does her part to get his page views up by using his videos to fall asleep. He leaves her satisfied at least in one sense. Joel would never tell anyone how many times it's worked for him. He's a gentleman who happens to know what rooms in what church have a lock on the door. And is a big help with hooks, zippers, and rolling down calf-high pantyhose. He whispers how much they deserve pleasure because they do, because everyone does. Giving the earlobe a little nip after removing her clip-on earrings. Somehow, he's never been caught in the act. This is how he knows God approves. He is but a tool of God. After all, isn't it amazing how God works through sinners? Jewel never brags about the women, no matter how drunk he gets. It's a three-way secret between God, Joel, and the once needy but now satisfied soul. Twyla would tell Joel to shut up if he was a braggart. Maybe she should care about what goes on behind those closed doors. Be more human, you know, actually be concerned about others. But hers is a religion of one. All right, I'm going to stop there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Beth and I had very similar fundy backgrounds, so it's all very hauntingly relatable. Um, all right. And as always, at our readings, we close with a faculty staff uh, reading, and today we have Claire Davis. Claire Davis is the author of two, count them, two novels, 
Winter Range, Season of the Snake, and a short story collection, Labors of the Heart. Winter Range was the first book to win both the PNBA and MPBA awards for best fiction and was listed among the best books of 2000 by the New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times, The Oregonian, The LA Times, and Seattle Times. She is co-editor of the anthology Kiss Tomorrow Hello, Notes from the Midlife Underground. Her stories have appeared in numerous publications, including the Push, excuse me, Pushcart Prize anthologies and Best American Short Stories. Her short story, Labors of the Heart, was featured on NPR Selected Shorts as performed on stage at Symphony Space in New York. She is a professor emerita of Lewis Clark State College in Idaho and currently teaches in the creative writing program at, can you guess, UWM and for Pacific University's Low Residency Master of Fine Arts program in Forest Grove, Oregon. Claire Davis, everyone. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, it's a, I'm good? <laughs> I think she needs to move the mic a little bit. I'm not as tall as one. <laughs> I'm not as tall as anybody. Um, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor to be able to read with this new generation of writers. It's a lovely thank you. I'm going to read from a work in progress. Um, started it about a year ago, short story, and set it aside because um, it wasn't doing what it needed to do, which was tell me where it wanted to go. I picked it up again recently and started working on it, so... I'm only going to read a bit of it because I tend to write rather long short stories, so. First wife. When it gets uncomfortable, when he becomes obtuse, hard-headed, and peevish, that's when she walks out, leaves with her father-in-law's wrinkled countenance watching from the house at her back, strides past the milk barn, past the machine sheds and corn cribs, and the pasture where the old bull lingers, the last of his kind on the farm, and long past the time when he has anything to offer but his back to the cows that browse unaccosted in the green, green grass. On days like this, she finds her way to the root cellar, where the stairs stitch down through the earth, and there tree roots winnow through rock walls, and spiders spin webs limp as sails on a windless ship. The air smells of toad burrows, and flat-capped mushrooms rise full sprung on the dirt floor overnight. On the near wall, the shelves are packed with glass jars, sliced pears, peaches, plums, apples, pale as nice-blooming lilies, beats like new moons. On the brass lid of each jar beneath the dust and the occasional seepage, written in marker neatly penned by the woman who prepared the stores, first wife. Her husband rarely speaks of her, his former wife, of 10 plus years. Not since the divorce five years ago, not in the four years Ada's been married to him, and she thinks that's a curious thing, though. To be fair, she's never asked about the woman either, and so who is she to judge? Still, the first wife lives in town a mere five miles distance where it's said she lives a full and happy life. Out here on the farm, all that remains is this, this hidden catch down in the far back of the root cellar, first wife, as though even then she knew there would be another. Ada, the second wife, Parses the jars like doves' eggs. She loves best the jams and jellies, marmalades and chutneys, and each time she cracks a lid, it's like dipping a finger into the past, like finding a friend, a sweet sister you never knew you had. She tucks the jar under an arm and settles onto a stool in the far corner. Here she will steal away as many minutes as she can, out of sight, out of mind of the old man, her husband's father, who will not be appeased, not now, not back then, not ever, she suspects. The same old man who crowds her in the common rooms of their home, who steeps his bare feet in a pan under their dinner table, who nightly ambles naked down the hallway on his way to the bathroom, the overhead light bright on the spectacle. When the next morning Ada complains, her husband brushes it off, says, 
It's just his way, and no one says you gotta look. It's just sheer wrong-headedness that has her plum out of comebacks. And she throws her hands up and, weather be damned, walks outside where at least the sun still rises and sets on the right sides of the world. But for now, in the far corner of the root cellar, seated on a stool, she slips a finger into the jam, brambleberry, and studies her feet that have grown a half size this past year, a thing she understands is not uncommon in women in their 40s. It's in times like these, contemplating her growing feet and softening middle, that she wonders why her husband chose her instead of some strapping 20-year-old as most middle-aged men were apt to do the second time around. Certainly isn't her talent in housekeeping. She has none. No, there will be no garden from her, no canning or sewing or whatever else homely gifts that other wife brought to bear. The rare time she worries about such inadequacy, she consoles herself with the fact that they hadn't seemed to have done her much good anyway. When she looks up, there along the rafters and joists are the other women of the cellar, the black widows familiar to this area, a shy crew, fastidious in their spinning, homebodies who mostly keep to themselves. Soon the swaddled eggs will split and a thousand more babes will be loosed into the cellar's near reaches. Before that happens, she will have to act. But for the moment, she's content merely to sit in the calm to lick the sticky treat from her fingers. On her way out, she checks the back shelf with its suspect jars, lids perilously belled, the beans, the tomatoes, darkest secrets. Ada tucks the jam jar in her pocket and climbs the stair to rise out of the cellar into the sun of a summer day. Halfway to the house, she sees him standing in the near distance, the old man, the gaffer, the coot, codger, buffer, goat, the doddering pater familias, standing with his back to her and facing off with the bull across the fence, squared off like two prize fighters whose bells have been rung. From this distance, she studies her father-in-law and sees how in the light of day, that is to say clothed, the man appears larger than she knows him to be. She's noticed it before. How in the tool and machine sheds or in the fields planted for winter silage or in the company of late day cows with their fulsome udders, how his shoulders square and the crook in his back lessens, the old fart less old somehow, drawing what's left from those most ordinary pieces of his day. She finds herself moved to an insight she, can normally lay, she can't normally lay claim to. They are two old bulls facing off against what cannot be stopped. She considers retreat, off to the wooded quarter where she might hide among the mulberry trees, but the old man has caught her out, turns and says, what you got going on back there? Did you need something, she asks. I've seen you time and again. Bringing up jam, she pulls the jar from her pocket. Its lid has come loose, and now her fingers and her pocket are newly sticky with its sweetness. That so? Took you long enough. Lots to choose from. She licks the thumb clean. She sh he shakes his head, having caught her, his son's second less qualified wife, beggar, thief, red-handed with her own inadequacies. She could can, I give her that. Ada ponders the idea. You didn't like her, she concludes. He looks her up and down, his nose pinching clothes, even as it does in his bi-yearly bouts of gout. Never said that. No, she admits. But did you like her? Overhead, the clouds gather, and the moment expands into several, and still she waits, and still he doesn't answer. They both know it's not really the other wife of whom she's speaking. On good nights, the woman and her husband have sex. And in her view, no, the problem isn't the sex. The problem is too few good nights. Her husband, after all, is still a strapping man at 54 years of age, an active man, her beautiful husband tan from the elbow down, tall at six foot four to her five foot nothing, and if sometimes she feels like a child standing next to him in the light of the day, well, not so of night in bed, that's when she's every inch his match. On such nights, she thinks that's why he chose her, chose her, 
Never mind that she was one of the last remaining unattached women in an overly large county down on its heels, he chose her. And just to prove him right, she never questions, never suffers the convenient headaches, there's no stalling or staving off for her. Then again, pray tell, who would after a lifetime of abstinence, a 40-year-old virgin when he met her, and who in that circumstance, 20-odd years behind the curve, wouldn't revel in it? With that many years to make up for, who wouldn't welcome it? So, yeah, every time he fumbles with her bra or taps her shoulder or presses into the small of her back, it's she who straps legs around him and won't let go until she's come. And long afterwards, when he's drifted off into sleep, it's she who suffers an embarrassment of sighs and insistent flutterings. It's her body that thrums under the sheets, the engine of her sex that slow to cool. But tonight, a first, she ignores the tapping at the small of her back. And when at last he wraps a meaty arm over her chest and strokes her breasts as though he were milking one of their finest, she turns to him and says, your father's a strange man. (laughs) Which she doesn't deny doesn't in fact even seem to hear. And so she takes him in hand under the sheets, holds him at bay down there until he looks over at her in confusion. What, he says, your father. And then there's a shrug and inevitably follows any question or statement she's ever made about his father. I don't think he likes me, she says, and feels a decided softening in her palm. My father? Yes, I feel like he's judging me. And no, he doesn't deny that either, doesn't tell her some comfortable little lie. Nah, he likes you fine. That's just not in his nature, always the one to tell it as it is. But now, in this moment, he says nothing. Instead, he takes himself out of her hands, stares at her. Ah, Christ, he's an old man. Half the time he's off staring at something just because it's there. Other half, he can't figure out what to look at. So how is him looking at you any different than staring down the bowl the other side of the fence like he does? He does that, don't he? There ain't no more to it than that. I just thought, you just thought this was the time to talk about it? He's looking at his hands as though he's just discovered them there, the sun-darkened fingers spread against the bleached sheets. You just thought to bring him into the bed with us? Now? Okay. Just maybe, she thinks, the bed wasn't the optimal choice for a discussion about his father. But, pray tell, what other time did she have? Daylight hours he spent out about the farm, tending cows, repairing machinery, disking, harrowing, planting, you name it. And nights he's bent over the table with its charts, planting crop rotations and pasture, or studying the milk market, the confirmation of catalog bulls and mail order semen. Most nights... They'd finish with dinner, some light reading, a bit of TV, maybe in bed early, and only then, if she were really lucky, sex before sleep. Which, it appears, will not happen this evening, because now he's swinging his legs out of bed, rising to his full height and striding out of the bedroom door. She looks after his retreating form, struck by how like his father he is. Same meatless shanks, tight shrub of hair on his back, his feet pounding down the hallway in the bathroom, as naked as his father on his nightly strolls. The world of the farm marches on. Calves bulk up, cows come into their scheduled seasons. The coals are shipped off in a sad, bawling truckload. While inside the house, beds are made, floors swept, dishes racked, an endless round of hot pot dinners simmer the day long on the countertop. All the ordinariness of ordinary life. But for her of late, she finds too soon all the work that needed done is done. The better part of her day spent looking out windows, staring out at the defunct poultry yard with its phantom chickens, the falling down goose house hedged in wild roses, or staring at the row of poplars that lined the drive, the whitewashed milk barn, the brown jersey cows cows browsing in the meadow. All of it like a goddamn John Singer Sergeant pastoral of the good life, the last of real Americana, the promised land. 
Yet here she is with some vague, unregistered dis-ease, drifting through the days, tidying already tidied rooms, moving here and there like a puff of lint, the last elusive dust bunny. It's past midday when she leaves the house in search of the old man, bearing the sandwich he did not come in to eat. She finds him at the far end of the pasture at the fence line, snatching at weeds with a weariness she'd become accustomed to seeing. Ever since her husband hired the neighbor's boy, Bill, to help with chores in the farm. The kid could drive tractor, pull his weight, and sling hundred-pound bales like nobody's business, according to her husband. It was time, he said, for the old man to retire. Time he took it easy, and in private time I had more help than hinder. At the time, she hadn't thought much of it. The way her husband let his father go that easily, but now it gives her pause. Now, in odd moments, watching the old man drift from field to barn to field, it causes her to wonder what manner of hindrance she might present in some future time. Time I gave the old girl a rest, time she took it easy, which gives her pause as to how his first marriage might have ended. As for the old man, what was it he said? I ain't no goddamn bull you put out the pasture, for all the good that did. Whatever arguments he put forth, it always ended with a pat on the back, and it bothers her, the pettiness of that gesture, like patting, putting a good dog in its place. So that she questions now. How is it that only recently she's come to realize, as legions of women must have done so before her in just such moments, that she's married a stranger. These days, when she looks out the window, it's the hired hand she sees in the yards, in and out of barns, deliberate as a steam engine, his body squat and thick with muscle, and there, there, her father-in-law out there as well, dogging the boy, wagging a finger, nitpicking this or that, but every day a little less his former self. She sighs, and the old man turns. He's always looked a bit of a gnome, but now his overalls wag in the wind, his hair is spindrift on his head, and the plucked weed spindles out from his fingers. I thought you might be hungry, she says. Thought that, did you? She wonders why she bothers. It's not as if she likes the old man, and it's not exactly pity either, though truth be told, he is a sad shade of what he'd been. They fall into an uneasy silence, and... Soon her attention drifts off to the near distance, red paint shine in the sunlight in the barn where even now her husband is gloved up and elbow deep in some cow's back end, a thing she's only ever needed to see once in her lifetime, thank you very much. She remembers what she came for, holds the sandwich out. Don't need it, he says, but takes the package and crams it into his pocket. You ain't got better to do? And no, she could tell, a matter of fact, she doesn't. They stand amid the clover and the hum of bees while beyond the fence line cloud shadows race across the grasses where the cows graze. And some few cows have fallen to their knees to drowse or chew their cud, the outline of their hides softened like butter melting in the sun. And for a moment, she sees it as he must in his despair, reduced as he's become, bystander in his own lands. She points to his pocket with its leaking package. It's peanut butter and ham, she says, and jam. You make it, the jam, he asks, knowing she hasn't. Would you eat it if I had? Nah, he says, and walks off. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I promise this is not a microaggression. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, Liam, Sonia, do we have any special announcements? Anything I'm missing? No? All right, well, thank you guys so much for yet another successful United We Read. Um, we'll be doing this again, as always. And uh, for those of you out there who are afraid to sing about love, about rage, or about just how weird everything is anymore, don't be. We're listening. You guys have a wonderful night.